All right, and welcome um, for the 10th edition of the Dolph Henkens Prize, Tent Rotterdam, organized in collaboration with Operator, a podcast series where the eight nominees are invited to talk about their artistic practice. I am Janine van Berkel, and today I'm here with Ada M. Patterson. Um, the work of Ada uh, seeks recognition for the complexity of bodies. She looks at bodies in crisis that remain invisible and are unjustly labeled as superfluous or unbearable in our contemporary world. In two related yet independent works, she researches various phases of reformation and transition, uh, during which changing bodies maneuver through external and inner worlds. So, <laughs> you have uh, two works in the exhibition. One is called The First Symptom is Refusal, and the other one is called You Know a Repercussion When You Feel One. Can you visually describe the works and what they are about? Sure. Um, the first work, uh, The First Symptom is Refusal, uh, is a very small starfish sculpture um, made of yeah, fabric, it's a fabric sculpture that I made, um, standing upright on a mound of black sand with its top limb stretched about two meters towards the ceiling um, with all its sinews and fibers um, revealed between the body and the limb. Uh, the, top of the, uh, the top limb is... Um, held in place by a fish hook um, at the top of the sculpture. And in the sinews and the fibers between the limb and the body, you can see all these different like pearls, sequins, shiny little fragments um, sort of scattered throughout um, the flesh. Um, and the second work, you know, a repercussion when you feel one, it's two steel, uh, steel rod sculptures um, with sort of plastic circles. Um, this is really hard to describe, actually. <laughs> but the sculptures are um, based on the shapes of double-second steel pans, um, a musical instrument that's mostly associated with the Caribbean. Um, and it mimics the, the note plates or the notation of, of the double-second steel pan. Um, but made kind of flat, uh, more 2D, if anything. Uh, it, for me, it's like a line drawing that's like, yeah, turned into a, a sculpture. Um, and the sculptures uh, act as a sort of like projection screen for, yeah, a sort of two-channel uh, video element to the work, which is a conversation... Um, or a call and response between uh, two of my friends, um, Marilea Morales and Kanea Indigo, kind of speaking about their relationship to sound, using their voice, um, sort of, yeah, throughout their experience, like from childhood to sort of present day. Um, yeah, um, through, I guess, like a black trans lens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beautiful. Yesterday I went um, to see uh, the installation, uh, or the two installations, and I'm wondering, is there, in what way do they relate or don't relate to each other? Mm. So for me, there are two attempts, I guess, at thinking about how to show a body or how to imagine a body that maybe has trouble being a body <laughs> um, or has trouble only being a body um, or only being a certain kind of body. <laughs> I think with the starfish work, um, I was thinking about like, I was thinking about failed survival tactics actually. Um, in relation to something that's happening with starfish, um, in relation to climate change, um, 
sort of this thing is happening more and more frequently, like with warming waters um, and changing sort of sea conditions, where starfish are sort of have been noticed to, um, yeah, uh, they've been growing like these white lesions on their bodies um, or on like infected limbs. And the starfish thinking that it can regenerate if it gets rid of the sever the, the infected limb, uh, severs its own limb and hopes that it will grow back like healthy and renewed. Um, but we're seeing like through this sort of infection that the regeneration process doesn't work anymore. Um, and so starfish are just kind of uh, dying. Certain kinds of starfish are just dying out. And for me, it's like this difficult choice that you have to make sometimes or different kinds of difficult choices you make in order to survive in the world that sometimes don't always work. Um, I guess I wanted to make space to honor failed survival tactics, um, honor those difficult choices we make that might, might not always work in order to make a different kind of living possible in the world. Um, I think with the second work, like uh, the conversation between between my two friends, it, it, they they do move through like moments of difficulty, but also so much ease and joy. Um, there's a lot of life in that work. I feel um, also like admittedly a kind of boring life, like easy life. Um, which I don't think you get to see a lot of or hear a lot of like around trans people, um, just trans people talking about music that they like or um, sounds they remember growing up, things that aren't so polarizing. Um, so I think for me, like, like there are choices made in that work as well. There are choices that are, be, that, are that are talked about um, by my friends um, in order to make these lives possible, to make their lives possible. Um, so, f so for me, the, the relationship between these two works is, yeah, it, it's mostly just about choices, um, very difficult choices for making other kinds of life possible in sometimes precarious conditions. Well, yeah, beautiful. Thank you um, for that insight, for sure. Um, I think while seeing uh, the two works, I noticed the perspective of being underwater. And uh, I'm wondering in what way, uh, yeah, in what way does the sea and being underwater plays a role in your work? Or maybe... That's how I read it. I don't know if you meant it like that. <laughs> it's definitely there, yeah. Um, I've been thinking a lot about like what it means to look for life underwater or look for a life underwater. Because um, there's something that happens in that kind of looking, like that decision to look. On one level, you're, of course, diving in, looking around, <laughs> seeing what's, what's, what's out there or what's down there. But it's also a choice to leave the land um, for me. Um, sort of reflecting on this, like, I, I've become so disenfranchised with um, not the land itself, but the structures that are built on top of land, um, sort of systems and ideologies, um, people's attitudes. Um, towards certain kinds of other people or other kinds of bodies, other kinds of experiences. Um, I don't really trust the land so much anymore. Um, so I think like looking underwater, looking at the different kinds of life that happened there um, in the dark, in the cold. Um, for me, it's, it's kind of a, a difficult hope um, for other kinds of possibility. Um, that have nothing to do with what's built here, um, of all places. I think as well, when I think about 
this being underwater, it's also like, I don't know, I, I, I came to this, this idea thinking about like what it feels like to live a trans life um, visibly um, in public, in my everyday, whatever. Um, and so much of it is tied to breath, like not being able to breathe, having one's breath feel like a struggle. Um, and this is not only like specifically a trans kind of experience, but for me, it's like a black trans experience as well. Um, and it's this, yeah, this feeling where one's ability and capacity to, capacity to breathe is put into question is um, no longer a thing that's so easy or it's, it, it's a luxury actually um, and so for me to think underwater is to sort of acknowledge the conditions of that precarity of breath um, and to learn strategies from sea creatures or whatever on how to how to how to breathe in unbreathable circumstances mm -hmm. so in a way you're imagining um an otherwise or an other place of being i think so on some level mm. i'm trying to i'm also like yeah like definitely on a more metaphorical level like I don't think it's possible for me to find a life underwater for myself <laughs> but um it's useful for my thinking and how to figure out how to live here um not only for myself but for my siblings <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah I think also underwater um yeah, it definitely resonates with me. Um, I'm also from the Caribbean, and uh, I fantasize a lot about underwater, and my favorite sound is uh, while being underwater. So in that way, I also notice that your work is a lot about sound, and uh, especially in the video work, you talk about, or there's talk about uh, changing voices, uh, the color of sound. Um, so I'm wondering what way uh, do you relate to sound? Mm. Yeah, I think for myself, like, it's become a lot more complicated. Like, um, I grew up, like, like I have a musical background, <laughs> like, um, before I before I got into the arts, I guess, um, when I was much younger. Um, like, I played steel pan. Uh, I learned when I was seven, and I played, like, frequently until I was 18. Um, and so, yeah, my upbringing is, re is really entangled with that. Um, like, not only just playing by myself, but, like, playing uh, with a steel orchestra, within a steel orchestra um, of about, I think, 50 to 60 members um, and also playing in wider contexts of um, like panoramas like these steel pan competitions like in some some um, countries in the Caribbean um, and so that's kind of like yeah I, that's my musical background and I'm trying to like return to that as well because I had to leave the my steel orchestra um for pretty like complicated, not so great reasons. Um, and yeah, I'm trying to like heal my connection to that, I think, like also through work or allowing the work to be a space for that process. Um, I think like as it relates to voice and this is really tied to the second work, um, you know, a repercussion when you feel one. Um, I have a very complicated relationship to my own voice and using my voice um, as it relates to like being trans or, or visibly trans um, or being audibly trans. <laughs> um, so it's like, 
Yeah, I, I think I wanted to use this work to really, really think of these questions um, and or think of the questions that I had for myself, but also basically ask the advice and experiences of, of, of two of my trans siblings because um, I wanted to figure something out and I wanted to give a bit more space um, for something more than fear or anxiety um, around like using my voice um, or thinking about voices in general. Yeah. Hmm. Um, what did you want to figure out? I think I just wanted to find some comfort um, and feel less alone in um, some of these questions I was having around like like, I don't know, um, what should my voice sound like? What do I want it to sound like? Do I need to change it um, to feel more comfortable with it? Um, or do I just... Do I just need to see other trans people speaking <laughs> um, comfortably um, or honestly, vulnerably, whatever? Um, yeah, I think it's more... Yeah, it, it feels like a sort of back and forth, like kind of, I'm not entirely sure <laughs> what it is, but I think a way to get closer to it is to have this kind of conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because um, your work uh, is personal, but then also it connects uh, with a larger community. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, how does this interplay work for you between the work and my community or yeah um or your personal story and the community or yeah i think for me like more recently like um i've been making work with a certain kind of people in mind <laughs> um though not I, I don't think that my work is only for them. I think it can be for everyone in as much as everyone like takes takes their time with it. Um, but I think, yeah, um, there's a difference between like who I'm making my work for, like or who I make my work in mind with. Um, Versus the people that just get to witness that. Um, I think I, I don't like to sort of include myself too explicitly within work. Because um, it's, I'm learning that it's, it's more, it's more than me. But the questions that I have for myself, if I give them a, a little space if I nurture them a bit um, I can sort of break open a space for them to be more um, I don't know to be shareable with other people um, for other people to have space in it um, through this navigation through this figuring out um, that it's not only for me um, in that way does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, I think so. I okay. think so. <laughs> I mean, the, um, uh, the show is just, did, it just opened. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm wondering if you already, or like maybe you already showed it as well to, to, to your community and maybe what the response was. Mm. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, I showed it back to... Um, to Kanea and um, Marilea, and they both really loved it, they said. Um, I, I think, like, yeah, we've had a few conversations about it, like, um, afterwards. Um, and, yeah, it, it's funny because it's like, this is just like a small fragment of the entire conversation that we had. Um, so, like, any conversations I've had with them about the work is um, 
it's not really about the work. It's about the experience that we share together. Mm. So I guess like what I mean when I say like other people just get, get to witness this. Um, they only get to witness a part of it as well. Um, there's, I think there's a question to be had in terms of where the work actually is, whether it's this crystallized thing that I'm showing here or is it the moment that um, I get to share with people in my community ha uh, having conversations or asking questions which we don't usually get asked or usually don't have time to speak about. Um, so like most of the conversations were also about stuff that I didn't include in the final edit um, and, and my own stake in it as well, um, which I don't show in the work quite deliberately. Mm -hmm. um, so there's like a lot there which is left out on one level to be discreet, um, but also again to kind of affirm this position of not all of this is for everyone. Mm. But what I'm offering is still generous. Um, what I've decided to leave in, like with the edit, edit um, given to me and sh uh, shared with by Marilea and uh, and Indigo, um, it's it's already so generous, even if it's just a fragment. Yeah, it is, and it is also very kind and warm. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed listening to it. Um, I'm wondering as well, uh, in what way, because you're practicing as an artist already for some time and before you were uh, musically trained, and I'm wondering how did your um, artist practice develop? Um, yeah, so... Even though, like, I was, like, working musically, like, more seriously than being an artist, I was still, yeah, I don't know, I did art at, in secondary mm -hmm. school, and, um, yeah, like, sort of when I finished secondary school, when I was, like, 18, sort of in Barbados, um, there was this process of, like, yeah, applying for university, and I ended up applying to study fine art like it was a choice between fine art or creative writing and I ended up with fine art because I thought it would give me more space to figure out what I actually wanted to do um and yeah like I don't know art school was was a trip like <laughs> um I can't say that most of it was very helpful but the work that I do now, it's kind of only really started happening after I finished <laughs> being in art school. Really? Okay. <laughs> Maybe the last year was like mm. interesting, but, but yeah, I've always, yeah, I've always like drawn since I was, since I was really young. Um, I used to draw characters a lot when I was younger, um, which I sort of returned to making after I graduated. Um, sort of turning these characters into costumes and performing them as well. Um, yeah, I think just like making has always been a space for me to to sort of sit with, with myself, with what I want, um, what I want to imagine as well in the world um, or what I want to imagine differently. Um, it's always been a space to just be with all of that to yeah give myself the gift of giving like giving myself something back mm. that's beautiful mm. i love that um and maybe as a final question then how do you see your practice develop what would you like like in the future yeah, yeah. to explore mm. um I'm quite enjoying working with video installations, um, like multi-channel video works. Like, I think there's, I, I, I'm enjoying like using the space of video to kind of hold everything that I'm interested in. Um, I mean, with this last work, it's sort of a, a lot more subtle. Like, it's the first work for a while. Um, 
it's a video that I didn't use any like costuming or anything um, or masquerade, which I'm, I guess, more known for or something. But um, yeah, I I still wanted to hold on to like the practice or the process of masquerade, like making a body discreet and invisible in a way, keeping it safe, like through a kind of coverage in this video work by only focusing on the mouth um, and hiding the rest of the body, really making the mouth be a character in itself. Um, yeah, I think for the future, like I, I kind of want to keep working on this, like finding strategies, um, not necessarily to for rep towards representation, but I guess ag against conventional ideas of representation. Um, which I have a lot of trouble with personally. <laughs> um, but yeah, I I find video like has given me a lot of space to hold, yeah, masquerade, bodies, performance, voice, sound, music, uh, textiles as well. Um, while also being able to like occupy space through like the installation element of, of it as well. Um, I think like conceptually um, I'm still figuring out like this underwater space um, I'm really like like it just really sparks my my imagination um, to think in this way um, and to sort of bring a kind of joy back to my to my work um, where criticality sort of took up a lot of space um, I find that, yeah, there's a joy on the horizon in my practice that keeps getting closer um, the more I look away from the land and my disenfranchisement from it. There's, there's more possibility when I just, yeah, choose to look towards what I want to see. Mm. Well, I'm very mm, curious to experience more of your beautiful work in the future. Thanks. And um, yeah, for now, thank you for this very insightful and beautiful conversation. Um, it was lovely to meet you as well. You too. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. And yeah, for all the listeners, I would say please also check out the other podcast about the Dolph Hankins Prize.